Good morning. Good morning. I'm Jean Patterson. I'm a member here at All Souls, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today on uh, hopefully the last snowfall of the year, right? Last one. We'd like to begin with welcoming any guests or visitors. So if you brought a guest or if you are a visitor, please raise your hand. Tell us your name and where you're from. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Others? Yes. Well, great. We're glad you're here. Anybody else? Yes. Great. Now, if you haven't checked into the visitors table, please be sure and do that so we can say hey further and give you any further information you need. Also today, there is a Sunday Plus lunch and visitors and guests are our guests for that. So when you go by the table, tell them you're a visitor and you eat free. So please join us for that. And uh, for everybody, don't forget later, there's the film about our 150th anniversary. No? That's next week? It's been postponed. Okay. 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 Never mind. <laughs> Welcome. I recently received a challenge from a friend of mine who is a New Yorker, and I want to pass it along to you. Next time you're on a bus, plane, or a train, put down your phone or your book, turn off your music or podcast, and look around. Think about the people riding with you. What is their story? What are their dreams? Who are they? Who are they to their family? Is their mom sick? Did they just get fired or promoted? <laughs> Where are they headed, both literally and figuratively? Are they on their way to the police station to meet their ex for a supervised custody swap? Or are they on their way to a birthday party, reunion, or funeral? Are they on their way deeper into a state of depression, or on their way to finally fulfilling their dream of graduating from college after so many starts and stops? What if in that one ride you would take the time to meditate on a blessing for one stranger? May you find depth and warmth in your friendships. May you not lose faith or hope. May you feel strong familial bonds. May you feel happy and blessed. May you find gratitude in many places of your day. May you learn how to move through your sadness in healthy ways. May you not be hungry tonight. May you feel valuable and special. May you know that you are loved beyond measure. May you know that you do not deserve abuse or harassment. May you know that you are beloved, beautiful, and full of purpose. Imagine with me for one moment that every person struggling with sadness had blue skin. The tint of their skin matched the depth of their despair. So the sadder a person felt, the bluer the skin. You could interact with people knowing that they were dealing with small concerns or deep sorrow. Would you react differently if the person that cut you off in traffic was bright blue? Imagine also that positive energy and compassion were made visible as they passed between people as force fields of golden light. If you were blue and you were able to see waves of golden light being sent your way, would your sadness be more bearable? 
Unfortunately, we don't live in that imaginary world of bright, mood-indicating colors. But can we still begin to actualize a sense of compassion for the people around us? A New Yorker friend was suggesting a mindfulness practice of compassion and blessing. If you rarely use public transit, when might this practice work for you? At a specific stoplight you encounter frequently? Or a grocery store that you frequent? In a big city like New York, or a little big city like Kansas City, people are everywhere. It would be easy to see them as the canvas to your own painting, instead of seeing them all as individual paintings of their own. What if we retrain our brain to see the world around us as more complex, aware that people are carrying many things around with them, aware that many people are blue? What about that neighbor who doesn't mow her lawn enough, or the guy that just went out of turn at the four-way stop? Can we commit to a practice of mindful compassion and blessing for at least one person today? Maybe this daily practice will help to crack open our hearts to an even deeper sense of compassion, not just for the stranger, but for the neighbor, for our family, and for ourselves. Let us light our chalice today in this spirit of mindful compassion. Good morning. My name is Evan, and I light this chalice for justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Thanks, Evan. Please join me in the words of our covenant. Together we affirm, Goodwill is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. As we prepare for a centering meditation, lay aside whatever is in your hands and bring attention to the way that your seat is holding you up. Bring your feet to the ground if you are able and rest your hands on your knees. Pay attention to the slow and steady rhythm of your breath. Feel free to close your eyes or bring your focus to the screen as we center ourselves. The sun returns, the days lengthen, Dusk delays, and the earth wakes from its slumber. The cold is slowly, ever so slowly, releasing its grip. Robins hop and peck. Creatures slowly unburrow from their frozen hollows. The human spirit thaws, too. Our winter fires are replaced by the warmth of movement, growth, community, Spring festivals, celebrations, and remembrances have replenished our reservoirs of energy and passion. 
This week, we celebrated the life of a man who gave light and fire and passion to so many despite his untimely death. May this moment of centering quiet together continue to fan the flame of passion and the fire of compassion. Please join in song as we sing our children to their classes. Anthony Edwards, and I'm the music director here at All Souls, and I want you to know what a pleasure it is to be here with you every Sunday, except this piano is like playing 88 blocks of ice this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I've often been accused of playing with gloves on, but I'm tempted to this morning. Uh, I, one of the things that I get to do uh, here in Kansas City as part of my outreach uh, that coincides with the outreach here at All Souls is my work with the Aid Service Foundation of Greater Kansas City. The, uh, the Aid Service Foundation for many years has been a touchstone for me and the community, and uh, the AIDS Walk is the main fundraiser of the Aid Service Foundation, and um, what, every month we give to a different organization, and this month uh, we are pleasured to give to the Aid Service Foundation of Greater Kansas City, which is uh, the organization that funnels money to the four aid service organizations here in town, as well as community grants. And with us this morning is the Vice President of Development and my very good friend, Christopher Dabner. Please welcome him. Good morning. Uh, 
first, on behalf of the AIDS Service Foundation of Greater Kansas City, I want to thank you for your generous donations. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, the AIDS Service Foundation was started in 1992 by a group of volunteers, and they saw that there was a crisis happening in Kansas City, and there were four organizations that were just trying to keep their heads above water. And a group of volunteers decided that they could get together and they could raise money efficiently and they could give it to the four organizations so that they could do their missions of health care and caring for people who at that point were pretty much always dying of a diagnosis. Um, those four organizations are the KC Care Clinic, which provides health care, Good Samaritan Project, which provides case management, um, SAVE Incorporated, which provides housing, and Hope Care Center, which is a skilled nursing home. So we are well past the time when a diagnosis of HIV is a death sentence. Now it is something that you can live with, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, of a lot of people. So there are 5,700 people living in Kansas City right now, and those four organizations are still going strong and they're still serving people in Kansas City. And um, they're volunteer organizations, and I have a great volunteer story that I think talks about all the people that are working in this, in this uh, community of people, that, people with HIV and AIDS. Um, this happened before I even knew that AIDS Service Foundation existed. I was a recently college graduate and I decided that I needed to go get an, an AIDS test and I came down to Kansas City and I went to the free health clinic and that was back in the time when you had to have a vial of blood drawn to get your test and if anybody knows me I am terrified of blood. So I'm there and I keep telling everybody that I'm gonna pass out I'm gonna pass out, and the, the helper who's there, who looks, it's about my mom's age, looks for all the world like a Johnson County mom with a little headband on and a cute little sweater and pop-up collar, just adorable. And I, I, I was thinking, what are you doing here? Crazy, but she was so much fun, and I went to the doctor, the phlebotomist, and he said, I said, I'm gonna pass out on you. He said, you can't, you can't. I, no one's passed out on me yet. You'd run my record. I said, well, I hate to do it to you, but today's the day. So um, just as he's getting me prepped up to draw the blood, in comes Sue with some safe sex pamphlets. And she puts those right in front of my face and she starts pointing at all the pictures and boy, doesn't that look fun? This looks like, this looks interesting. Have you ever tried this? <laughs> And all of a sudden, all the blood was gone. It was in the vial. The test was over. I hadn't passed out. And, and it was done. And the next week I came back, I got my test results. Everything was fine, luckily. And, but Sue wasn't there. And I was so disappointed that I didn't get to say thank you to Sue. Well, as luck would have it, six months later, I was in the Prairie Village hen house waiting in the checkout line, and there was Sue. She volunteers down, she volunteered for 15 years doing HIV tests down at the free health clinic. So, and now I see her at all sorts of uh, events that go on in the AIDS community in Kansas City. I see her at the Bloom party for the free health clinic. I see her at the AIDS walk. I see her at the AIDS luncheon. So. The community in Kansas City is really amazing, and I think that the AIDS Service Foundation is at the center of that, because we raise money that those organizations can use for anything they need, not something that's granted, not something that's required, but whatever it is that they need to help the people in Kansas City who are living with HIV and AIDS. So thank you very much for your donations this month. We really appreciate it. And I hope that we will see all of you on a sunny, warm April 28th for the 30th anniversary AIDS walk down in Tice Park. So um, we, I have been told that if you give by credit card, we will be taking donations by credit cards out in the lobby after the service. So 
Thank you very much. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. Now, let us join in in the words of dedication for the offering. We dedicate our offerings and our actions to the mission at the heart of this congregation to build a respectful, caring community, to inspire personal and spiritual growth, and to create a just and compassionate society. Thank you. From the Soul of Money by Lynn Twist. We each have the choice in any setting to step back and let go of the mindset of scarcity. Once we let go of scarcity, we discover the surprising truth of sufficiency. And by sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Sufficiency isn't two steps up from poverty or one step short of abundance. It isn't a measure of barely enough or more than enough. Sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It is an experience, a context that we generate, a declaration, a knowing that there is enough and that we are enough. The following is an excerpt from a commencement speech. Feel free to sit back and put yourself in the shoes of the 2005 college graduates that initially heard this message from one of this millennium's prophets. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks at the other and goes, what the hell's water? <laughs> if at this moment you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise old fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The immediate point of the fish story is that the most obvious important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about. 
a huge percentage of the stuff that I tend to be automatically certain of is, it turns out, totally wrong and deluded. Here's one example. Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid, and most important person in existence. We rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive, but it's pretty much the same for all of us deep down. It is our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There is no experience that you've had that you were not the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is right there in front of you or behind you or to the left or right of you on your TV or your monitor or whatever. Other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, real. But please don't worry that I'm getting ready to preach to you about compassion or other directedness or the so-called virtues. This is not a matter of virtue. It's a matter of my choosing to do the work of somehow altering or getting free of my natural hardwired default setting, which is to be deeply and literally self-centered to see and interpret everything through this lens of self. By the way of example, let's say it's an average day. You get up in the morning, you go to your challenging job, and you work hard for nine or 10 hours. And at the end of the day, you're tired and you're stressed out, and all you want to do is go home and have a good supper because you have to get up in the morning and do it all over again. But then you remember, there's no food at home because you haven't had time to shop this week because of your challenging job. And so now, after work, you have to get in your car and drive to the supermarket. It's the end of the work day, and the traffic is very bad, so getting to the store takes longer than it should. And of course, when you get there, the supermarket is crowded. Because, of course, it's the time of day that other people with jobs are also trying to squeeze in some grocery shopping. So eventually, finally, you get all of your supper supplies. Except now, it turns out, there aren't enough checkout lanes open, even though it's the end of the day rush. So the checkout line is incredibly long, which is stupid and infuriating. The point is, that petty, frustrating crap like this is exactly where the work of choosing comes in. Because the traffic jams and crowded aisles and long checkout lines give me time to think. And if I don't make a conscious decision about how to think and what to pay attention to, I'm going to be pissed and miserable every time I have to food shop because my natural default setting is the certainty that situations like this are really all about me. And it's going to seem for all the world like everybody else is just in my way. And who are all these people in my way? Thinking this way is my natural default setting. But if you've really learned how to think, how to pay attention, then you will know that you have other options. It will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, loud, slow consumer situation as not only meaningful, but sacred. On fire with the same force that lit the stars, compassion, love, the subsurface unity of all things. You get to consciously decide what has meaning.
and what doesn't. And the world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings, because the world of men and money and power hums along quite nicely on the fuel of fear and contempt and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom, the freedom to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms, alone at the center of all creation. This freedom has much to recommend it. But of course, there are all different kinds of freedom, and the kind that is most, most precious you will not hear much talked about in the great outside world of winning and achieving and displaying. The really important kind of attention, real important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, petty, little, unsexy ways every day. That is real freedom. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. I know this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy or grandly inspirational. What it is, so far as I can see, is the truth with a whole lot of rhetorical bullshit pared away. None of this is about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about simple awareness, awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water. This is water. I believe that we live the story we tell ourselves and others about the life we're leading. I heard this quote the other day, and it got me thinking. What is the story that we tell ourselves and others about the things that really feed us, the things that nurture us? What do we tell ourselves and others about what is really important to us? And how does that compare to what we actually spend the most time doing in reality? In other words, does our perception of ourselves line up with our reality? 
Have you ever heard the age-old saying, you are what you eat? In numerous ways, this saying is inaccurate and simplistic, and yet there is a kernel of wisdom there. For instance, if a marathon runner is trying to train her body in the most optimal way, she'll be conscious of what she feeds her body, knowing that her intake of food translates directly to the fuel she will need to finish a long day of running. It probably wouldn't take more than one instance of mishandling her food intake the day before an important race to understand that if she fails to fuel her body properly, she might not have enough gas to make it to the finish line. She is what she eats. Staying with our food metaphor a little longer, let's talk about the song from Oliver, Food, Glorious Food. It is a song sung by orphans who are on the edge of starvation. All they get to eat day after day is gruel, which is essentially watery oatmeal. In the midst of this scarcity, the orphans close their eyes and imagine every possible glorious food item. They imagine a different world where they are provided with three lush banquets every day. And after stuffing themselves on every imaginable and imagined culinary delight, the thing they want most of all, the thing that they really dream about, is the very same thing that rich gentlemen have, namely indigestion. This song aptly captures the impulse in the midst of scarcity to indulge in whatever excess is available, even to the point of misery and pain. We are what we eat. In our current world of media, whether that means newspapers, movies, books, TV shows, theater, or social media, we primarily use terms with food and consumption connotation. Our social media platforms have a feature called a news feed. We talk about binge watching TV shows, and our DVR has a menu of channels from which to choose. We discuss how much news we consume and whether or not the news is digestible. This is no accident. We live in a capitalistic and advertising-soaked economy that is subtly and constantly encouraging us to consume perpetually more, even though we might already be full, whether that is on food, clothes, books, movies, or news. We are what we consume. What would happen if we were able to be more mindful about what we were consuming and why? Nutritionists encourage the practice of mindful eating, a practice that asks us to be more aware of our hunger and our fullness, to understand that sometimes we crave food when we are emotional, and sometimes we get emotional when we are hungry. When we bring that same awareness to our media consumption, we might begin to recognize some trends. Maybe we turn on the TV to counteract boredom instead of wondering what kind of creativity that boredom could produce. Maybe we reach for our phones when we are lonely and wanting to make a connection, but then get carried away with Candy Crush or Instagram, instead of reaching out to a friend to grab a coffee or go for a hike. How would we benefit from being more mindful about our media consumption? We are increasingly aware of unaware of, sorry, or uninvolved with the process of and inquiring of our food. And it is similar in many ways with our media. We see and hear and consume media throughout the day, every day, consciously or not, and we often fail to control or monitor what we consume. There are motives and profits behind the algorithms that dictate what advertisements we see. If we don't stop and notice these motives, we become like the fish who are unaware that we are in water. One example is the 24-hour news cycle. Among other things, the 24-hour news cycle creates a glut of information, which leads to our sense of FOMO, millennial slang for the fear of missing out, FOMO. <laughs> this fear of missing out manifests itself in our tenacious desire to be up to date up to date on the news or on the latest TV shows, up to date on the Oscar nominees 
on the president's latest tweets, or on what's trending on Facebook. This fear of missing out is just another way to say that we are experiencing a scarcity. We want more information, just like Oliver and his friends want more jellies and custards. If we want to avoid this media indigestion, we must heed the advice of Lynn Twist. Let me read it again. We each have the choice in any setting to step back and let go of the mindset of scarcity. Once we let go of scarcity, we discover the surprising truth of sufficiency. By sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Sufficiency isn't two steps up from poverty or one step short of abundance. It isn't a measure of barely enough or more than enough. Sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It is an experience, a context we generate, a declaration, a knowing that there is enough and that we are enough. What might it look like to understand and embrace the idea of sufficiency when it comes to our media consumption? When have I had enough news? How can I let go of my need to catch up on my reading list or my Netflix queue or on my stored up pile of crossword puzzles? How do we learn to shut off our intake valve for a time and sit in the stillness of our own presence? How many of you have been watching the news or listening to some kind of program lately and become afraid or worried about your lives or your children's lives? If you have read Wendell Berry's poem, you know that his solution isn't to go deeper into the news and the worry, or to rest in the peace of your news feed. It is to go and lie down where the wood drake rests in its beauty on the water. It is to come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. In the interest of being true to today's message, we are gonna try a new thing and pause for a moment to rest in the stillness of our own presence, to digest a bit before we consume more so that we may avoid indigestion. It is in your power to board a bus or train or plane and put away your devices and books for a while, to look around, to observe more of what's happening around you, to say a blessing of loving kindness and to find some kind of beauty or stillness amidst the chaos. Or using David Foster Wallace's language, it will actually be within your power to experience a crowded, loud, slow consumer situation is not only meaningful, but sacred, on fire with the same forth force that lit the stars. Compassion, love, the subsurface unity of all things, or as I like to call it, the interdependent web of existence. A person who meditates on kindness, gratitude, and interconnectedness will find more opportunities to experience kindness, gratitude, and interconnectedness. It can work as a self-fulfilling prophecy we are what we eat. Or put another way, we notice that which we meditate on. Our default settings will continually push us toward consuming unconsciously. And it will take much of our attention and energy to swim against 
the currents of scarcity, FOMO, and gluttony. It will take some effort and discipline to sit in the simple awareness of what is real and yet hidden in plain sight. Just like the fish, we must keep reminding ourselves, this is water, this is water. Please rise for our closing hymn. reading from Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water, and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind day stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. <laughs> <laughs>